this being the period that I want you to memorize for the cosine graph right here. So this is our cosine graph, and there's five points on it. It's all the y values of one, zero, and negative one. So let's talk about periodic right now. So in English, periodic means from time to time, or it repeats every so often. In math, it means it repeats, not every so often, but very specifically at the same amount of time or after the same amount of distance on the x-axis. So definition f of x is periodic. periodic with period P and P so P is going to be constant if f of x plus P equals f of x so that means if you can add P to the input whatever x is and you doesn't actually change the output. So we looked up at the graph here. I circled, there's an infinite number of points I can match up. I circled these two points right here and said, these are the two points I'm talking about, that one and that one. And as long as they are one period apart, they'll have the same y value. I could have taken any point on the graph and moved over exactly one period, they'll have the same y value. Doesn't matter what point I chose. If I scroll over more, you'll see that I would find the same point right about there also. Because I can take any point, even the next point over, that matches it and move another period over. So algebraically, we can look at that property. So that's the definition of periodic. So let's consider f of x plus 2p. Now I can write this as f of x plus p plus p. That's what it means to add two p's. And I'll just regroup, reassociate like that. So if f is periodic, so we're going to consider So we're assuming uh, f is periodic with period p. Now if I just use the periodic property, I look at, here's f of something plus p. So if f is periodic, that means I have a little plus p at the end. I can ignore that. I can just erase it. It won't change the output of the function. So I could write this as f of x plus p. So at last plus p, I just use periodic property to say that that doesn't matter. We don't need that one. And right here, I can use a periodic property a second time. So f of x plus p is just f of x. So if I add two times the period, it's the same thing as just f of x. Now, what if I go f of x plus 3p? We could play the same game twice, basically. I could take out a P, and then another P, and another P. So do the same thing three times, and we get F of X right there. So I can add, and now you should believe that I can add as many periods as I want and get back to F of X. And this is for integers, for n in the integers. So from what I just showed you, you should definitely believe that all positive integer values will work. So we just showed it for 1p, for, or we assumed it for 1p, showed it works for 2p, 3p. I don't need to show anything past that. You probably believe it. Now negatives might be a little bit tricky. So in order to show it for negatives, let's look at, so we'll look for negatives now. They're a little bit tricky. 
unfortunately, I can't use my rule up here for x minus p. It only works for plus p. So I'm going to do something sort of sneaky. Let's actually start with regular f of x. Why are these equal? And I'll give you a hint. It's not because f is periodic. Because the p's cancel. So minus p plus p, that's just like adding nothing. So that's just f of x. So why does that last p right there, why does that last p not matter? So why is f of x minus p plus p equal to f of x minus p? So the last, the second inequality, why is that one true? So because we have, we're using our periodic property right here. So now I'm using the periodic property to say that little plus p at the end, that doesn't change the value. So I just added a p in there. And so what we have, uh, we have, just looking at the first and the last, all three are equal. So I'll just cut out the middle term. So that means f of x equals f of x minus p right there. So it'll work if you start subtracting p's also. I can do the same thing with minus 2p, minus 3p, et cetera, et cetera. So you can add as many periods as you want. doesn't change the value. That n sort of looks like a u. But as long as you're consistent, it could be whatever letter, as long as it matches. So as many periods you want to add, no problem, positive or negative. So we'll use this periodic property right here. So you've done a few problems like this, but you haven't really use the periodic property, you thought about doing multiple laps around the circle. So if I give you a big angle, we'll go cos of, let's do 17 pi over 4. So it's definitely bigger than 2 pi. So if we write 2 pi in fourths, we get 8 pi over 4. So now I want to write 17 pi over 4 as some So let's fill in the blanks so that this is equal. How many 8 pi over 8 pi over 4s can we fit into 17 pi over 4? 2 so I'll put 2 right here. And what is our remainder? Or how many pi over 4s are left? 1. So we'll get just pi over 4 left over. So I can write 17 pi over 4 is 2 periods plus pi over 4. Now this actually is the same as thinking about a division and a remainder right here. We're, div we're basically dividing by uh, 2 pi and looking at the remainder. So the remainder is, in our case, pi over 4. So this will be two laps around the unit circle and another pi over 4 afterwards. So I can write this as cosine pi over 4 plus 2 times 2 pi. So we saw why that 17 pi over 4 is pi over 4 plus 4 pi. So we did all the fractions down at the bottom of the screen. So we don't need to redo all that. Now cosine is periodic with a period of 2 pi. So 
So our period for cosine is 2 pi. So what can I do with this uh, plus 2 times 2 pi? Does that change the output of cosine? So I can add as many 2 pi's as I want, it's not going to change the output of cosine. So from the periodic properties, this is cos pi over 4. So we could ignore, basically ignore the fact that we went two laps around the unit circle and just say, well, just use pi over 4. And that'll have the same cosine value. And now you need to know if cos pi over 4 is 1 over square root 2. So now we're going to find cos of negative 97 pi over 3. Now if you try to draw, so we're definitely going counter, no, regular clockwise because we're going backwards. Are negatives fun to think about if you don't have to? Not really. So how, there's one way I can deal with this negative in one step. Cosine is an even function. So how can I write this? This is equal to the cosine of what? So if I use an even property, I could basically erase our negative sign. If it was odd, I'd bring the negative out front. But this is an even function, so I get to write this as cos 97 pi over 3. So we use our even property. Sorry, the pen doesn't work very well at the edge of the screen. So we'll use use our even property here. So we're going to play the exact same game we just did. We're going to see how many 2 pi's, obviously there's a lot of 2 pi's in 97 pi over 3. So how many 2 pi's can we get into 97 pi over 3? Now 2 pi, if we're right in thirds, 6 pi over 3. So I'll give you a minute to figure out how many 2 pi's or how many 6 pi over 3's are inside of 97 pi over 3. You can try to guess and check. Uh, you can also just do uh, 97 divided by 6. And look at that. That's another way to do it. This tests your arithmetic skills right here, not really your algebra skills at all. This is an arithmetic problem. Eighteen should that be an eight or a seven that I just wrote? I was gonna be my third guess.
So 97 is 6 times 16 plus 1, hopefully. Is that right? You're better at numbers than I am. I don't really do numbers very much. So that's all of our arithmetic. So let's pretend that we're geniuses in arithmetic. So this is cos uh, 16. I'll write it as cos pi over 3 plus 16 times 2 pi, which is cos pi over 3, and that's 1 half right there. So if you tried to spiral around 16 times around the unit circle, that would take a really long time. You, you wouldn't be able to see the spirals anymore. So then at some point, you need to break down and just go arithmetic and look at remainders. Yep. Okay. Well, in order to do that, you kind of have to do division to, yeah. to get to that point. Uh, sometimes it's not, the numbers aren't so bad. Let's do one more quick example. I'll do 100 pi over 3. I'm doing 100 pi over 3 so I don't have to spend much time figuring out the arithmetic of it. So I just added three more pi over threes. So that should be 16 with four with remainder four. So I just put in three more, so there's gonna be three more remainder. Now there's two choices here. Well, there's an infinite number of choices, but what if I wrote 17 of these periods plus how many more pi over 3's? How many more pi over 3's? It doesn't have to be positive. Negative 2. So you can actually go one past it, and we got negative two. So those both are the exact same number. You just went basically threw in another two pi. So our remainder is actually negative in this case. You don't have to go this way. I'm just showing you an alternative way to do it if you want to go a little bit past it. So this could be written. Now, we've done some examples where we just basically look at the remainder. It's cosine of the remainder because as all those two pi's don't change it whatsoever. So I could write this as cos 4 pi over 3, or I could write it as cos negative 2 pi over 3. I can go either way. There's not a wrong, well, if your remainder's wrong, you most likely will get this wrong, but you could actually choose multiple remainders here. And now I can use even properties. This is cos 2 pi over 3, just using the fact that it's even. And what is cos 2 pi over 3? I know these are difficult questions early in the morning. Cos 2 pi over 3. I don't care about the y value. So negative 1 half is cos 2 pi over 3. So this will be negative 1 half. Now up here I wrote that it was equal to two other things. So where is actually, if we went for regular cos, uh, or cos of negative 2 pi over 3, where is negative 2 pi over 3? It's in a similar spot except you rotate clockwise. So we're going to go the opposite way. So that is negative 2 pi over 3. And what is our x value here? Negative 1 half. Now I'm not saying anything about the y values. The y values are definitely different. 
But remember, we're talking about cosine. We're not talking about the sine values. And here is where you can see sine is odd. So sine 2 pi over 3 is actually the negative of sine negative 2 pi over 3. So if I was talking about y values, they'd be negatives of each other. And where is 4 pi over 3? 4 pi over 3 is the long way, or the scenic route, over to the second angle I drew. So 4 pi over 3 is the exact same point on the unit circle down there. They all have the same exact cosine value. Doesn't matter which of the three ways I want to think about it. So that's how algebra, the algebraic property of even matches up with your unit circle right there with cosine. Now, of course, you could draw out 100 pi over 3, but every little, you just spiral around a whole lot. The, if you actually used 100 pi over 3, you would be at this really, really big point that I just drew right there. Because it actually is either 4 pi over 3 remainder or negative 2 pi over 3. The positive 2 pi over 3 I got from the even property, not from our remainder. So this is sort of a little bonus up here that comes out of cosine being even not out of the remainder property. So I recommend even odd properties are really nice. They let you deal with, or basically forget about negative angles, and you pretty much only need to deal with positive angles if you use even odd. There, when you did graphing in pre-calculus, so who did graphing by hand, not on calculators? So who did graphing on calculators mainly? All right, so the few of you who put your hands up, you may have to work a little harder for graphing because we're not going to use calculators. But I'm going to set it up uh, to be as straightforward as possible, and it will be because of the algebraic properties we're going to use, it will be much less difficult than it was to graph uh, all the transformations in pre-calculus 1. So there's not that many functions. There's really only six trig functions that you have to do. And we're going to use things like an even odd to avoid uh, horizontal reflections, which is a big pain. And we're going to, I'm going to write it out in a certain order so you don't have to worry about which one you need to do first. I will just tell you which one to do, which step to do first, second, third. And it won't be nearly as tough as it was in pre-calculus one. Now, if you didn't take my pre-calculus one, I, I don't know how tough it was for you, but if you took my pre-calculus one class, this should be a little less involved than our graphing in pre-calculus one. So we're going to start out with, we'll start out with a horizontal shift. And we'll do horizontal shift and stretch at the same time. So this was the really hard part of graphing, was all the horizontal stuff. It's backwards of what it looks like. So it looks like you add, maybe you added a pi to it. What that does, instead of going right pi, that'll go left pi. So when you add something, it actually shifts you to the left. Uh, when you multiply, so if you graph uh, cos 2x, it's going to, instead of stretch it, two horizontally, it's going to compress it by one half horizontally. So here is a standard form that I want you to use. So we're going to let f be any trig function. Obviously, we're going to do cosine first, but this will work for any uh, trig function f. This is the form I want you to graph in. So 
So our, we'll write down the period first. So normally the period was 2 pi, but that multiplied by h right there in the middle, that, or not multiply by h, uh, multiply by a is going to change the period. So normally you would multiply by a and things would get uh, bigger a times, but in this case it's horizontal, so it's going to shrink by a. So that's like dividing by a. So our period is going to be 2 pi over a. So you take your original 2 pi period and you divide it by a. And then our shift, you can see the shift right there. That's the period shift is going to go. So I writ, wrote it as minus h. So if it's negative, you're going to go right h. If it's positive, you're going to go left h. The period takes care of the horizontal stretch. The shift is a horizontal shift. Now when you graphed other functions, you had to stretch before you shifted. We're actually going to do them at the same time. So we're going to be stretching and shifting at the same time. You won't have to remember which one's first or second. They'll be done at the exact same time. And what about big A, capital A? What does that correspond to? What transformation does that correspond to? I'll give you a hint. We're at done with horizontals. So w vertical stretch or shift? It's going to be a stretch. So you're multiplying, so it's going to get A times, uh, you don't really want to say A times taller, but A times stretch vertically because it goes stretched up and down at the same time. So you don't just want to think it's getting stretched up, it's getting stretched sort of away from the X axis. So period shift. So the, I'll just write this is our vertical stretch. So it's going to be stretched up and down by A. Uh, this is also called the amplitude. So we have period, shift, vertical stretch. And what is the last transformation? It's the plus K. So that'll be our vertical shift. And that's going to go up K. So the sine and cosine function, they're all waves. All that, they're not supposed to be getting bigger like that. They're supposed to be all the same size. Up by K. So if you go to Westport, go surfing. You're probably into waves. So if we just look at this, so a period is how much time between a wave, basically. Shift, uh, that could be if the current's sort of weird, it's moving waves. That doesn't usually happen at a good break. But vertical stretch, the amplitude, that's how big the waves are. And vertical shift is basically the tide, more or less. So if you want a real world example, uh, Shift doesn't really have good analogy. I'm not super into surfing, only mildly into it, but shift is probably the one that doesn't really have the best analogy. All right, so there is a trig function and how to get the four properties out of it. So almost every trig function has a period of two pi except tan and cotangent, if I could write cotangent, except tan and cotangent, our period is regular pi over A. So most of the functions go 2 pi over A, tangent, cotangent are going to go pi over A. So now we're going to use this and start graphing some examples.
Oh, we should use a plastic spoon. All right, let's start out easy. F of x equals, let's do three sine two x minus pi over three. So it's pretty easy to see vertical stretch by three. So verticals are always easy to see. So let's not, we're not gonna worry about vertical until the end. Why is this not in standard form? What is the difference between standard form and this f of x right here? A coefficient. So that two, let me write, let me write this as g of x because I have f of x written up at the top. So we'll call this one g of x. So what I need to do is rewrite it And I have to be very careful about what number goes in there so that when I distribute it back out, I get pi over 3. Anybody want to take a guess at what number goes there? I'll give you a hint. It's got a pi in it. So it should be pi over 6. So if you use intuition, or what I call guess and check, you're thinking, oh, well, when I multiply it by 2, it needs to be negative pi over 3. So you need to unmultiply it by 2. If your intuition doesn't work uh, that well for numbers, then another way to do it. So we had what? And let's see, we'll use, we'll go with b. What times negative pi over So I want to multiply negative pi over 3 by something such that when I multiply it by 2, I'm back to negative pi over 3. And what is the something? Well, that's going to be 1 half right here. So I need to unmultiply by 2 or multiply by a half. Or if you want a more algebraic way to think about it, I'm going to factor a b out of here. How do I do that? There's no b in the second term. So this is x plus b times x plus what? C over b. So we're taking a, we're unmultiplying by b. So we're dividing by b. So this is c over b. So that's all we're doing right here. You're just taking whatever that number is, dividing it, or unmultiplying it by b. So now I have three pieces of information. We're going to do horizontals first. So I need to find the period, and I have the phase shift. I'm looking right at the phase shift. Is that pi over 6 to the right or the left? To the right. Negatives to the right, positives to the left. So we're going to shift to the right, pi over 6. So we call this our horizontal. And our period, P, equals 2 pi over A. In our case, A is 2. So our period is going to be 2 pi over 2. So here's the most common wrong answer. Hey, your period is 2. Why is that? Because you look and say, oh, look, there's a 2 right there, so the period must be 2. So the period's not 2, the period is the original period divided by that 2. So don't just take that number and say uh, the period is that number. It's the regular period divided by that number. So when we go to graph, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to draw one period, but we're going to start it at pi over 6 pi over 6 to the right. Now what I need to do is go one period 
over here. So our period, we said p equals pi. So why do fractions suck? Should I put more fractions on your quizzes and midterms? No? So why, why do we not like fractions? Why are they confusing? Unless they're common denominator, they're hard to think about. All right, so I want to go pi, over, pi written as in terms of pi over 6. I got 6 pi over 6. So my first point is pi over 6. My last point is 7 pi over 6. So I need to go full pi to the right. So our period goes from pi over 6 to 7 pi over 6. So make sure you're in the same denominator so this is not so hard to do. So we go full pi to the right. And now you need to remember your uh, cosine graph somewhere. We circled it. I'm redrawing this graph right here, but using our period where it begins at pi over 6 and ends at 7 pi over 6. So we got five points to draw. 7 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6. Where is 1? 1 will actually be pretty big. We'll say that's 1. That's minus 1. So we're going to start at 1, end at 1. Now I have to cut this in half. We're going to be at negative 1. So there's the 5 points. They actually make a V. When you graph it, you don't connect it like a V. You're going to try to make it smooth, hopefully. What is the middle x value here? between pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6. So if I give you two numbers and ask for the number in the middle, how do you do it? Add them, divide by 2. You can take the average. That's how you get a midpoint. You average two numbers, you get the middle number. So you can do that. Pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6, cut it in half, 4 pi over 6. Now, for the x-intercepts, these two points on the x-axis, that's a little more tricky. You have to average pi over 6 and 4 pi over 6. 5 pi over 6 cut in half is 5 pi over 12. So I actually have to drop down to twelfths to get that. So this will be 5 pi over 12. And if I average 4 and 7, that's 11 pi over 6 over 2. That's 11 pi over 12. So that's where fractions get more tricky. You have to average those two together. If you write it out, hopefully you'll believe it after that. And then you just draw your graph like this. And there is one, there's one period right there. So try not to do this graph right there like a V. And we'll do plenty more examples of this.